I'm going to talk about this evening was not a native for me. She was actually born in Bradford in 1871. But I think the fact that there is a blue plaque um, on the house in which she lived in Bourneville for a large part of her adult life, highlighting her work for women's suffrage and for trade unionism, gives her at least honorary Brummie status, and well-deserved, I think it is too. Miss Farley was once described as a woman who always enjoyed a good fight if the fight was in a good cause, and she certainly identified the cause at a very young age. She became a hugely respected figure in the labour movement, championing women workers, seeking better pay and working conditions for them. Their bravery, those women's bravery in joining trade unions, in the face of intimidation very often, and the very real threat of losing their jobs and then not being able to find another, of standing together to demand workplace justice is just as worthy of, as recognition as those like her who are remembered on blue plaques. And so this is also their story. And this is indeed what Julia Varley herself would have wanted. Because in fact, when she arrived in Birmingham in 1909, she was instrumental in setting up something she called the Birmingham Social Service Committee. And it was designed to teach young women the principles of trade unionism, and above all, to give them the confidence to organize themselves rather than wait to be led by others. Julia Varley herself left school at the age of 12 to work in a textile mill, as I say, in Bradford. And by 15, she was secretary of the Bradford branch of the Weavers' Union. I think when we look at Julia's life, we need to remember how much courage she displayed in stepping out of the roles that society expected <coughs> of a working class woman in the late 19th century. Her father was not at all keen when she became involved with the union. A male colleague recalled that she'd done so at a time when it was almost a moral crime for women to be in unions. And here she was, not just a member, age 15, but the branch secretary. She had to give up her work, her paid work, when her mother died, and she was needed in the home to look after her younger brothers and sisters. That, of course, being a much more typical role for a working class daughter than running a trade union branch. Her father was even more horrified then when, after Julia was elected as a poor law guardian, she decided, aged just 24, to go on what she described as on the tramp, to find out what life was like for women who had to sleep in the casual wards of workhouses, women who were constantly on the move looking for work, or living in seedy lodging houses. Is a customer announcement. Contemplation room on level two and the Shakespeare Memorial Room Whoops. on level nine will close at 6 50 pm. The Library of Birmingham will close at 7 pm. Our Lab Express service on the ground floor will remain open until 9 pm. <coughs> Thank you for visiting us today. Okay. Uh, yeah, okay. Workhouses and CD lodging houses, I think, was the last thing I said. Julie disguised herself as a married woman looking for her husband, who she said was a chap called Jim who was working on the Liverpool docks. And she became, in her words, a ninepenny dosser, learning a great deal about harshness and injustices that many women faced. In fact, she recalled that one of the reasons why she was initially drawn to the fight for the vote for women was because one evening she was propositioned by a man in evening dress outside a music hall. I think she was in Oxford at the time. When she returned to her lodging house, she realized that one of the women had been arrested that night for accosting, and she knew that if her, it, she, it occurred to her that if her earlier encounter had been witnessed by a policeman, she too would have been arrested, whilst the nicely dressed gentleman would have got away scot-free, his story believed over hers. She was, she said, determined to get to see the inside of a women's prison so that she could compare it with the workhouse, and her chance came when, as a suffragette, she served two short spells in prison as a result of attempts to enter the House of Commons. She says she treasured all her life the summons from the Metropolitan Police 
which bound her in the sum of two pounds to appear before Westminster Police Court for obstructing the police and behaving in a disorderly manner. And incidentally, her other most prized possession was the letter bidding her to Buckingham Palace to receive an OBE in 1931, which is quite something then for an old jailbird. In 1909, she moved to Birmingham at the invitation of Edward Cadbury to encourage the organisation of working women into trade unions. There's just a few slides that kind of indicate the sort of work that she was encountering women doing. And these are all with, you know, and I would like to say, this is a wonderful collection of photos from the TUC library collection. Edward Cadbury was acutely aware that conditions for working women in trades across Birmingham were largely nowhere near as good as those existing in his own Bourneville factory. There were thousands of women engaged in different manufacturing processes across the city, some in factories, some in workshops, others working at home on various forms of so-called sweated work where wages were extremely low. Women trade union leaders at the time estimated that the average wage for a working woman in England, and I don't like to talk about averages, but I haven't got very long, um, was around seven shillings and sixpence, whereas it was about 25 shillings and ninepence for an adult male. So it just gives the, uh, an example of discrepancy. And many women were on wages that were even lower than that. The women chain makers of Craigley Heath, for example, with whom Julia Varley was involved. Commonly, they earned just five or six shillings a week for 14 to 16 hour days. And here's a description of a visit um, that Julia made to the house of a woman making buttons, a typical Birmingham trade, in a lightless, insanitary house where, she wrote, the table was filled with cards and buttons. Three children and an old man sat with fingers flying up and down scarcely a pause as the buttons were stitched onto the cards. The woman was hoping to have a good week. They were trying to finish the last lot, which if done in time would bring in six shillings for the week. Mother, five children, aged grandfather, a good week, six shillings. Father, when in full work, was paid 18 shillings a week, but he was delicate, had a weak chest, and was often ill. So Julia Varley recalled witnessing tiny children who spent every minute between bed and school, beside a table, helping to put the buttons onto card, might, she said, with the hurt of ages in their eyes, the skill of adults in their fingers. In three years, Julia Varley had made a great impression in the Birmingham area, taking a leading role in the successful women chainmakers' strike in 1910 for a minimum wage, and another in Bilston, where she found herself a, quote, pitched headfirst by an employer some seven or eight feet down a steep bank and injuring herself. She refused to prosecute, however, considering that as she stood on the employer's wasteland, she'd taken the risk. After a spell with the All-Female National Federation of Women Workers, um, this is a reenactment of the Chainmaker Strike, and there's the famous Mary MacArthur and the Federation's banner, um, Julia was appointed as the sole women's organiser for the mixed sex workers union because believing that for effective unity and strength men and women ought to be in unions together not pitted against each other. <coughs> this post itself in 1912 was a remarkable achievement for a woman at that time and was desperately needed. Too often women employers sought to employ women because they could pay them far less than men. And this, of course, led to resentment from men rather than an understanding of the importance of being in the union together to stamp out such practices. The First World War saw an enormous increase in the number of women trade unionists. And Julia Varley, who considerably strengthened the women's membership of the workers' union in the years before the war, continued now working with munitions workers to ensure that government and employer promises of fair pay were upheld. Although very few women achieved equal pay with men during the war, factory pay for women did at least improve, in large part due to the work of those who sought tirelessly to unionise women. <coughs> 
Julia Varley's understanding of the complexities of women's lives, particularly in wartime, came in very useful. Finding the time and confidence to attend union meetings was very difficult for women workers. Combining work with running a household, often single-handed while husbands were away fighting at the front, rushing to queue for food items in short supply after they'd finished a day's work before picking up the children from the nursery or from neighbours. And she drummed into the women who joined her as organisers of the union that what she described as pleasant Sunday afternoon mother's meeting methods of recruiting women into unions were ineffective, they just weren't going to work. What was needed was for women to be treated like equal members of the union alongside the men. When the war ended and women began to be driven back into traditional low-paid work, union organisers feared that the gains made during the war would be lost and women would disappear back into the work where, because they'd been so isolated, organisation was hard to achieve. This was certainly the case for domestic service. And although many women after the war deeply resented a return to this low-paid role, and others objected to the implication that this was naturally women's work, as they were being told by the government, and that they should simply be capable and willing to do it. For many, there was simply little else to be had in these post-war years. And rather than urge women to avoid working as domestic servants, Julia Varley's union and others took a more pragmatic view and set out to raise the status of the job and to obtain more rights for servants. Julia Varley's union provided space for women servants to meet in Loveday Street in the gun quarter in rooms that they furnished out with chintz curtains and matching chairs, a Broadwood grand piano that had been donated, the latest illustrated weeklies and lots of books. The room was made as welcoming as possible and girls could drop in for a cup of tea. I use the word girls because that's the word that was used at the time after their shopping all intended to reassure these young women that they weren't as isolated as they had been before the war. Girls' mistresses could come along if they wanted, but it was definitely a club with trade unionists at the forefront. Described by the Daily Chronicle in 1920 as a servant's paradise and the envy of the girls' mistresses. They even drew up a servant's charter, emphasising the necessity of regular hours for servants. I'm going to talk over the top of This is a customer announcement. Yeah, I can't. Can I talk over the top of that? And the Shakespeare Memorial Room at level 9 will close in 10 minutes. The Library of Birmingham will close in 20 minutes. Our Love Express service on the ground floor will remain open until 9pm. Thank you for visiting us today. Okay, so the servants charter, yeah. It, making sure that servants weren't exploited by their employers. Mm -hmm who simply expected them to be available whenever required. They asked for a minimum wage, a fortnight's holiday, you know, things that we take for granted now, a comfortable bedroom, the use of a bathroom once a week, and decent plain food, much of which had you know, been missing from, in the lives of many domestic servants. Interestingly, when Julia Varley was asked why the club only survived for a couple of years, she said it was due to snobbery. She said you wouldn't believe the class distinctions there were among servants. The cook wouldn't mix with the housemaid and all that sort of thing. But perhaps the main reason for the failure was one faced by the entire trade union movement. As unemployment in the 20s and 30s rose, so trade union membership fell. But Julia Varley kept fighting for women's workplace rights. She continued in her role as chief women's organiser for the workers' union, and she became chair of the TUC women's group. She was involved in the work of the Society for the Overseas Settlement of British Women, travelling to Canada in 1925 to meet women who'd settled there, and she was deeply involved in the Industrial Welfare Society. Her connections, well, there she is with um, organisers, there's, there's Julia in much, which is in 1908, so looking very different from the first slide. Lovely picture. That's Mary MacArthur of the National Federation. Women workers. And this one is Jessie Stevens, who ran a domestic servants union. And nobody knows who the middle one is, so if anybody can let me know, that would be great. Um, anyway, um, she retired in 1936, despite a progressive loss of vision, and eventually returned to Bradford to live with her sisters, dying in 1952. One of many obituaries described her as self-reliant, 
fearless, often impetuous, but abundantly blessed with solid common sense. She had all the qualities needed for the pioneering struggles in the period up to the First World War. And just one final story. According to Julia, radicalism was in her family, it was in her blood. Her great-grandfather had been at the Peterloo demonstration in 1819 for parliamentary democracy. He'd been a chartist in the 1830s. And she told a story about her work in Birmingham during the First World War when she was exhausted, the size of the task was overwhelming her, and she said she was nervous and depressed. And above the offices at Loveday Street, the spiritualists used to hold their meetings. And one of the officials said to her, Julia, for goodness sake, get up to spirits. And she said, as she sat upstairs in the meeting, the medium suddenly said to her, there's a lady sitting in the second row and a very old man standing behind her. He's wearing old fashioned clothes and he has a message for her. Pull yourself together, he said. You're not fulfilling your destiny. And I think Julia certainly went on to do just that. So thank you. Thank you.